Hey friends, I am back today with a very special guest, Ruth Joy Connell. And today we are going to talk about pricing. I know from working with my clients, this is something that is very intimidating and they often are number one, afraid to charge for anything that they do. And number two, they don't have any idea where to begin in terms of those numbers and putting a dollar sign on the value that they're providing. We oftentimes get so in our own heads about money mindset. And I'm going to link in the show notes, a couple of other episodes where we talked about money mindset, namely the one with Judy Weber back in I believe the very beginning of 2022, but I want to emphasize this today before we dive in and Ruth shares her wisdom on pricing. You have gifts that God has given you and those gifts are meant to be used. And if you hold those to yourself and don't share them, then you're doing a disservice to those people that are out there just waiting for you to come along and help them and solve their problems but you're also doing a disservice if you don't charge your worth and your value. And why is that? Because number one, if people don't pay for something, they aren't going to be as invested in it. So if you are a business coach, if you are offering a service, even as a health trainer or something in the medical field, it doesn't matter. The reality is if people don't pay for something, they aren't invested in it and they aren't going to do the work and they aren't going to take action in a way that is actually going to end up creating impact. So as we begin this conversation, I want you to set your mindset to, I am worthy of making money. I provide value that is worth being charged for. And my time is worth being charged for. So think about those three things. And the other thing I want to add on last minute is that we oftentimes get so inundated with the mindset of, making money is bad. Charging for things is bad. And that is not the case. If God has given you gifts, he is using you as a tool to help other people. And you are worthy of making money. When you think about the people in the Bible that were leaders, they were making money. They had jobs. They worked. The Proverbs 31 lady, she made money and she reinvested it into other businesses. And the more she did that, the more she helped other people. So think of your money as an opportunity for you to then go forth and tithe and serve and do greater things to make a bigger impact in the world. It's that ripple effect of good. Okay, I'm going to stop rambling and I'm going to bring Ruth onto the show. Ruth Joy Connell, welcome to the Robin Graham Show. Thank you, Robin. So good to be here. And I know my name's a bit unusual because usually it's like Ruth Ann, but my first name is Ruth Joy. I love to go by that. I love it. And I love the joy in there. And listeners, you can't see her. Maybe if you're watching this on YouTube later, you will see her, but she has a beautiful, beautiful smile and she just does radiate joy. And one of the things that Ruth is passionate about is creating generational wealth. And one of the ways that she helps her customers do that is through pricing so that you don't lowball your price so that you don't make enough money, but you don't overcharge so that the people that really need you can't find you and afford you either. So she is going to tell us all about this today. And I am so super excited to dive into this conversation because I know it's going to help everyone make decisions, better decisions on the prices that you're charging. So Ruth, now that we've said all that, will you please tell the listeners a little bit about you and your journey to get to where you are today? Yes, certainly. Thank you so much for the introduction, Robin. And I'll start at the very beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. And when I got into this, I noticed that I was actually switching course from wanting to pursue a career in medicine and as a surgeon more specifically, and recognized that although I loved medicine, I love science, it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do in the long term, but I did know that I had this passion within me to still run something of my own and really be able to help people in some way. I just didn't know exactly what that looked like. And so when I first started my entrepreneurial journey, I started with something simple. So when I very, the very beginning, I was working with bloggers and helping them get traffic to their website by doing things like guest posting and guest, guest podcasting. And so that was where I first began. I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do, but I just started moving forward and figured I'd learned along the way. I'd figured it out along 
the way in, in that I knew that because of my own personal experience growing up in a financially adverse situation, uh, I knew that I wanted for myself, not just to have financial stability, but to have knowledge around how to make money, how to earn money, how to be a good steward of money. And so I knew that I, I was getting into that direction as I began my business. And because of my corporate background is also in sales and sales leadership, I've also had the opportunity to be in rooms where very large deals are being made and see how that negotiation process goes and be sitting in a room where we're discussing a contract that's $200,000 plus. And me, this at the time, young black girl sitting at the table being like, freaking out in my mind. I cannot believe we're just talking about $200,000. Like it's a meal at McDonald's. Whereas this is every day for the people that I work with and for these companies. And so having that insight, I'm so extremely grateful for that insight because with my desire to be able to help others in a financial way, based on my own experience and with the background that I had in sales over time, I was able to bridge that together into the work that I do today, which is really helping businesses and positioning them for long-term success by ensuring that they have the financial background and the financial foundation, not just to be able to support their business and their operations today, but in the long-term. And so the main ways we do that is through pricing and through helping them secure corporate revenue so that they have a large untapped source of revenue stream for their business so that they can continue to feed their vision and impact them themselves, their teams, and their communities in the long term. Oh my gosh, you said so many incredible things there. So I love your journey. We both have that scientific slash medical background. Nice. Which is cool. I love when I have fellow scientists on the show, not that we're <laughs> going to dive into science, but just yeah. <laughs> that brain connection. Okay. So before we dive into pricing, because obviously that is so critically important, but when you talk about corporate revenue, so the majority of the listeners are entrepreneurs, some small business owners, but when we talk about corporate revenue, explain that to us, would you please? Yes. So what I see is corporate revenue is working with companies that are willing to invest at minimum five figures or more. Now, this can look very different because you might have another small business owner, another entrepreneur who's willing to invest in your service or your program that may be priced at $10,000 plus, et cetera. But typically when we're looking at a corporation, what I mean by corporate revenue is that it is the company who is hiring you and not necessarily the individual who is hiring you. And so that's a good differentiator between what is corporate and what is not. And typically when it comes to corporate revenue streams, there, so five figures is the minimum, it goes up from there. So it's usually starting at around 10,000, but can go up anywhere to the six figures, multiple six figures and seven. And so even just one of those contracts for an entrepreneur, for a small business owner has a massive difference on their bottom line and a massive difference on the financial resources that they need to grow their business. Because one six figure contract securing that, even if it took you six months or eight months to do, significantly propels you forward as opposed to trying to secure that same level of revenue through working with customers or selling online courses, et cetera, which is a longer pull and definitely takes a longer amount of time. So that's what I mean by the corporate revenue stream is the company is the one that's hiring you and not necessarily any one individual person. So looking more towards the entrepreneur who is perhaps a business coach, but focusing on the corporate employees as opposed to business coach or business coach to small business owner. Yeah. I love that you said that Robin, because you just painted a picture that a lot of entrepreneurs don't see. So as a business coach, sometimes we think we can only work with people who own businesses or who run businesses, but realistically, even in a corporate setting, even in working within a company, there's something called intrapreneurs. And those are people who have that same level of ownership and passion around the work that they do, but they're doing it on behalf of somebody else. But companies want them to be able to take that ownership and be able to run with their tasks, with their responsibilities, and really own their role as if that company was their own, as if that team was their own, et cetera, or that project even. And so what you just did by even just bringing that example to the table was open up the door for entrepreneurs and, our, and the listeners here to see that there is always an opportunity 
opportunity for you to work with corporate with the exact skills that you have now. And you don't need to change your business model. You don't need to create something new. It's just about learning how to position yourself for that particular audience. So to your point, Robin, the business coach who is working with the people who are within companies, oftentimes what we do is we target the individuals and ask them to be the ones to pay us so that they can invest in their development, their profession, their career, et cetera, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. But there's also an opportunity to go directly to the company and say, I want to partner with you to provide these resources for your leadership team or whoever you're targeting within that company so that you can provide them with the resources for them to grow and develop and be supported in a way that's going to meet your company objectives, but also in a way that's going to meet their career goals as well as they are looking to develop and advance. And so you can still go the route of targeting the individual employees within the company, but you can also, or sometimes it's even better to go the route of targeting the company and say, hey, I can partner with you to reach your team and to provide you with these resources and training in the same way that you would for the individuals. You're just speaking to essentially someone who already has the revenue set aside to invest in their team. So that conversation looks a lot different and it's less about convincing them of what you have to offer, but more that you are the right fit for that company. I love that so much. Okay. So that just opens up a whole new world to anyone who is listening that is a business coach or Mm -hmm. is an Instagram coach or any other type of role that you're doing on it. And really, I guess it, you can almost look at it as you're limiting yourself if you aren't reaching out to, to, to bigger audiences. And I, I just was listening to something this morning about LinkedIn and how LinkedIn is such a powerful tool for networking. Mm. Listen, my wheels are spinning right now because this is an an environment or an area that I haven't tapped into myself, but because of what I do, it's something that realistically could really be an opportunity. Just putting content on say LinkedIn can give you that opportunity to connect with corporate employees who can then go to their HR representatives and say, Hey, look, I'm thinking about doing this training because I know it's going to help me become a better leader within my organization or help me become more attentive to specific details for projects or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you bring them in to your world. They're going to bring their corporation into your world. Great information. I love this. And we've never had this conversation or anything like it on the show. So this is amazing. Okay. So let's talk about pricing. Yes. So where do we begin? And you mentioned five figures, six figures, seven figures. Those are huge numbers when you think about it. And there's a lot of opportunity, but a lot of entrepreneurs aren't tapping into those numbers because they don't feel confident in charging for their services. And they're starting low, which is fine to start low and gradually work your way up. But if you start too low, people aren't going to see your value. And one of the ways we can differentiate ourselves as a personal brand, as a business is to price according to who you want your audience is, who your soulmate clients are. If you're charging too low of a price, you're going to ring in people that aren't going to align with you, your values, your work ethic, and all of those things that you really want for your business. And then again, if you price too high, maybe you are not attractive to the people that are your soulmate clients. So you really have to be mindful of your ideal audience, which we talk about so much, but you really do have to be attuned to who they are and the level of financial backing that they actually have. So absolutely, the floor is yours. Tell me about pricing. (laughs) Absolutely. So you pointed out in talking about being aware of who your target client is, that is extremely important. And that's part of the framework that I'm going to run through in just a moment. But I actually want to take one step back. And before we get to the actual framework, I want to talk about the confidence factor. I know that's something that a lot of us struggle with, and it's usually not necessarily a money-related thing as opposed to, as in we present to the fear as though we're scared that people won't pay for what we're charging and see the value in it, but usually it's because we are still struggling to see the value in what we're offering. And so it, it actually goes one step further. It's less about the target client and a little bit more about us as individuals and what we're going through. And so I do want to encourage, Robin, you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation today, you talked about a previous episode in which you talked about money mindset. And I do encourage everybody to go back and listen to it because when it comes to pricing, 
we often make a personal endeavor when it's usually it should be a professional one. And it's important because the feelings that we have around money, the experiences that we've have around money, those things are all valid and they come up when we are addressing pricing within our business, when we're having conversations with potential clients. They are valid. Your experiences are valid. They're valuable. They're true. And yet they're still separate and have a place to be dealt with outside of having conversations with their target audience. Because when someone says, oh, I can't afford that, or I think that's too expensive, what it does is that becomes a trigger for us about things that happened 5, 10, 15 plus years ago. And, it, and then at that point, we're not even talking about money. We're not even talking about business. We're now dealing with our own feelings that are coming up in those moments. And so I encourage everybody to really continue to do that work of shifting their money mindset, understanding their stories around money and working through them so that you can bring your best self and be your best self for your clients when you are bringing your services to the table so that you can stand firm in the value that you're offering them and really be able to allow them to catch on to the confidence that you have in yourself. So I always like to start there to say, the experiences and the challenges that you have around money mindset are completely valid. And it is important for us to deal with them in tandem, but separately from the work that we're doing within our business so that we can show up as our best self. So that's the first place I would start before we get into actual framework. I love that. And I agree 100% because we need to do the money mindset so that we can then help our audience, our potential clients, when we're on that discovery call, help them navigate money mindset. Because you mentioned it, you said people will say, oh, I can't afford that. I don't have enough money for that. It's mm -hmm. really not about the money. It's if not. you are resourceful, you can find the money. And I, I've ha gone through this discussion so many times and I think I recently even posted it on social media or it's an upcoming post, whatever, but it's one of those things that it's all mindset, because if you really want to have an impact, if you really want to reach success, if you really want to serve people, you mm -hmm. have to overcome the money mindset. And then you have to help other people navigate money mindset and Absolutely. understand that there are resources available. And there are so many unique, creative ways that you can come up with the money to do something. And okay, I'm going to stop talking and let you dive into <laughs> I just, so, I love this. I get so excited and passionate about this because it's such do. a huge obstacle for people and it shouldn't be, but because we're human confidence, fear, all of these things have an impact on that. So that's why the mindset work is incredibly important. Yes. So important. Okay. So as you are working on the mindset, because you don't necessarily need to be all the way there in order to begin evaluating your current pricing as it is now. So as you're doing that, a framework that we have is called the pillars of pricing. And this walks you through different factors to consider as you are setting the actual dollar amount that you are going to be charging for your service. And so I'm going to walk you through each one of these pillars. A few things to note is that they are in order. So as we walk through, we're going to go in order of sequence and they each pillar builds on the previous one in order to position your business for profitability. So that's what we're looking to do with this framework. So the pillars of pricing, pillar number one is profile. And this Robin is where you talked about really understanding who your target client is. That's what profile is. So whether you are targeting a individual client, a person, or whether you're targeting a corporation, if you're targeting a corporation, we just refer to it as a profile. So what's a profile of the company? Because you're not really dealing with one individual person. There's probably going to be several people in that process. So we look at the company as a whole. But essentially, when you're looking at this profile, what you are truly looking to understand is understand the problem, the challenge, or the goal that this either individual or company is looking to solve. So what are they struggling with? Now, the difference between those three, the reason that I separated out, and it's just a slight change in language, but the reason that I separated out is because sometimes there might be a wellness coach, for example, who's, they might not be dealing with a problem, but I'm looking to partner with someone to get ahead of something or to help them maintain something good. So it's not really like they're struggling right now, but I'm actually working with them either for maintenance or to just take it to the next level. Like they're in a good place, but they want to go to the next level. So that's why I just say separate it out because if you might have a, an easier time for your own business or the work you do by using a slight variation. Problem, a problem being something that is causing them or their business harm, 
a challenge being something that they're struggling to overcome and a goal being something that they want to achieve. So based on the services that you offer, that language might help you be able to see a little better who your target audience is or what they, what their current situation might be. When you're creating this profile and when you are looking to understand, essentially you want to have a deep and thorough knowledge of their problem, challenge, or goal, and really understand how it's affecting them, what they have tried in the past, where they have been successful and unsuccessful in either resolving or achieving whatever their goal might be, and really understand what are the key factors that influence their buying decision or their decision around looking and investing in a solution for this problem, challenge, or goal. And so profile is really just having a deep and thorough understanding of what this problem, challenge, or goal is so that you can speak to it in a way that connects with that target audience. And so the reason that we put this as pillar number one is because it is foundational to the Mm -hmm. work that you do, that you have a deep and thorough understanding of what you are trying to solve, of the person or even the company that you are trying to partner with so that you can go in there. And that in itself, that knowledge and understanding in itself is the foundation of confidence when you can speak to their challenge or their problem, when they can hear their struggles reflected in your in how you're speaking, even in your content, it might not even be you verbally speaking, but even in your content, see their challenges reflected in that and understand that this person not just knows, but understands what we've struggled with and what I'm looking to achieve and how it's impacted me. That is the foundation of being able to price anything because what that does is that immediately and subconsciously knocks down a pillar of objection, right? Mm -hmm. Because when it comes to pricing, And especially pricing objections, when when potential clients are hesitant in moving forward or paying your pricing, it's never, as you said, it's never about the money. It's almost always about the confidence in you, your work, or your outcome and what you can produce for them. And so if we are pre-doing the work, because we've taken the time to understand, we've taken the time to identify, we're now taking the time to make sure we're communicating our understanding and our knowledge, not just our solutions, not just your service, but your, your actual understanding of what they're going through or where they are right now, you're communicating that in your content, your marketing, et cetera, you are setting yourself up for success when we actually start to talk about numbers and when you are pitching your service because you are pre-doing the work. And so that's why profile is pillar number one. I love it. I could not agree more. And the reality is that if you aren't addressing objections upfront, mm-hmm. you are going to be experiencing an uphill battle. Yes. So- It's very good to, and all of your content creation should have that frame of mind to address the problems, the challenges Mm -hmm. and the goals so (laughs) that it just becomes natural that this is how you present yourself to the world, either through written content, verbal content, interviews, whatever the case may be. Okay, go ahead. Absolutely. All right. So pillar number two is positioning. And so positioning traditionally refers to a company's ability to influence the perspective of others about the work that they do. So you'll hear what market are you in when it comes to positioning or what industry that you work in, et cetera. And those are things that, yes, are part of positioning and are important to establish. So for example, you may work with coaches. For example, you might be a a product business owner where you sell physical products, whether it's clothing or apparel, you might be in the fitness industry or health and wellness, et cetera. So those are different types of markets that you can be in. That's one part of positioning and definitely important. But what we did is we added another component to it that I think is also extremely important. And that's what I've referred to as prestige. And so to help you understand that prestige, really, I believe this is how companies, especially larger companies, really influence their buyer's perception and set them up again, subconsciously set them up to understand what their pricing is going to be, and to also address those objections ahead of time. So prestige being what position you want to take within your market. So to give an example to explain this a bit more, I like to use the example of Walmart, Target, and Nordstrom. Each one of them extremely successful in their own, but they each have a different level of prestige. They each 
target different types of companies, different types of customers, sorry. So Walmart, for example, is all about low price, high volume. Walmart is always advertising. You'll get the lowest price here, even price match if you find something lower than, than what we offer. So their whole thing is you're going to find low pricing here. In that, there's also other things that align with that level of prestige, like the level of experience you're going to get. For example, I'm not going into Walmart expecting to be waited on, expecting to have a luxury type experience. I'm not. I'm going to go in, get what I need, and get right out. There might be a line. Sometimes it's hard to find somebody to help you when you're in the store. There's a whole bunch of self-checkouts. So I'm probably not even going to interact with a, an employee when I'm checking out my items. I might have to do that myself. Uh, which when self-checkout first came in, people were like, this is ridiculous. I'm essentially doing the work of a paid employee. But in companies like Walmart, where their their level of prestige is lower, and they're like, we're here to get you the deal on the product, but not necessarily focusing on the experience. We're trying to help you to save money. That makes sense for companies like Walmart, and that's okay. So who they target is very different. It's aligned with their price points. They're not advertising or marketing to multimillionaires or people who are living in very affluent neighborhoods. They're targeting just the everyday individual who is looking for deals and who is looking to be able to live comfortably within whatever their means are, right? And so they've made sure that their profile is aligned with their positioning. And so just as we talked about earlier, the problem they're solving is a very low case problem. I want to save a dollar. It's not a very complex problem where there's also Target. Now, Target is a little... Uh, is a step above Walmart, but not quite a Nordstrom yet. You know that when you go into Target, you're going to find items that are priced a little bit higher. Stores tend to be cleaner. There tends to be a little bit more staff on the floor. They do still have some checkouts, but they also have a lot of people at cash as well. And it's a different feel in a Target, right? The quality of their items are a little bit better. You walk with your head up a little bit more when you're in a Target. <laughs> a little fancier than you would if you were in a Walmart. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is how Target is positioning themselves. They're not, they're saying we're not too expensive, but if you want something nice, if you want a good experience, then this is, then we're for you, but it's not going to be quite as low price as Walmart is, but you're still going to get something nice and it's still going to be quote unquote affordable. Right. So that's where Target's positioning in terms of their prestige are in the middle. And then you have a store like Nordstrom, who's on the further end of the spectrum. And Nordstrom is saying, if you come in here, expect to spend a lot of money <laughs> in here. Nordstrom's, even their physical positioning when it comes to stores and malls, they are always on a corner where their store and their sign can be seen from the freeway or from the street. They always have glass for their windows. There's always an employee within every single department. It, it's usually very rare that you'd walk in and not find an employee in every single department. The stores are usually extremely clean, et cetera. And so when it comes to this level of prestige, what we're saying and what we're encouraging you to ask about your business is, do you want to be a Walmart, a Target, or a Nordstrom? Keeping in mind that each one of them is successful and there's nothing wrong with positioning yourself as a Walmart not everybody needs to be a Nordstrom. You'll notice there's a lot more Walmarts than there are Nordstroms around. So being a Walmart doesn't make you any less successful. It just helps you understand who, with that positioning, what else needs to be aligned in order to make sure that there's consistency in that. So in terms of your experience that you're offering, in terms of the quality that you're offering, et cetera. And so that's why we really look at prestige because that's what subconsciously we are drawn to everybody is different and every client and customer is going to be different. But if you can understand and target the people who are looking for the same level of prestige that you want to offer, then that in knocks down barriers as it relates to pricing and addresses right. those objections ahead of time. Yeah. And I did an episode, oh my gosh, it's been a while, but I will link it in the show notes as well on how pricing differentiates you. When we talk about differentiation, there are so many levels to that, but pricing is one of the key because you have to know number one, who your audience is, but number two price accordingly, but that, that helps identify you as a business owner. That's part of your personal brand to differentiate yourself. And pricing is one of those things that does that. So I will link that episode in the show notes as well. Okay. Are we on number three? Yes, you actually just segued into it perfectly. <laughs> We're talking about differentiating yourself and that's pillar number three is your proposition or unique value proposition as some people know. And so to keep this very simple, 
your UVP, your proposition is typically going to fall into one of three categories, either the process that you have, which is the methodology or the framework that you use, the result that you deliver, which is what you help your clients achieve or address and the outcomes of that. And then three, or the experience, which is the experience being how they feel when they work with you and the kind of environment that you create in bringing them into your ecosystem of work. So typically your proposition is going to fall into one of these three categories and you taking the time, like us as business owners, taking the time to really understand where our proposition lies helps us answer the simple question of why should I choose you? So when a client is asking that question without using those words, because they're talking about the price or somebody else is cheaper, or I can get it here, or maybe I can even do it myself. Those are different words, but really what they're asking is why should I choose you? And when we haven't taken the time to answer that question for ourselves, we of course can't communicate that. And certainly not with any level of confidence to the potential client that we are speaking to. And so really taking time to understand, do you put a stake in the ground to say we are excellent in our process, in our results, or in our experience. Now you can be, because typically what comes to mind is, what if I'm excellent in all three? (laughs) Chances are you're excellent in one, great in another, and good in the final. Mm -hmm. And they're all good. Those are all great places to be. But I want everyone to really think about where am I going to put a stake in the ground for excellence to say, this is what we do better than anybody else that I know. And we strive to do this at the highest level. So again, your process, your results, or your experience typically in one of those three areas. And I want to add something there. If you are struggling to identify which one you are excellent at, Look at the testimonials that people have left you regarding your work with them, because that's going to give you a clue as to where you have provided the most value or had the Mm -hmm. most influence on their work with you. Okay. Number four. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And then lastly is the profit margins. And this is where we actually would pull out a calculator and now start talking numbers. It's after we've established the foundations of the first three pillars. Now we're at a good place where we can say, okay, what makes sense based on the profile, based on the positioning, the prestige, and as well as our proposition, what numbers actually make sense for what we're offering here. And so you'll see when we talk about pricing, we're not just talking about numbers. We're not ta- we're not starting off with how do we raise your price 10% or when do we give discounts? It's none of those conversations matter until we've been able to establish these foundations because this is actually what helps sets you up for success with whatever those numbers end up being. So when we talk about profit margins, what profit margins are is what's left over after you have paid for all of your expenses and the cost of doing business. So the money that's left over after everything has been paid for, including your salary, including just your regular monthly bills, the money left over, that's profit. And so when we are talking about profit margins as a pillar of pricing, we want to make sure that there's a minimum of 30%. Now, depending on what industry you're in, that might vary a bit. And for some, it might be harder to get to that number than others, just depending on the nature of your work. But ideally, we would like there to be a minimum of 30% profit margin baked into the pricing of your service. And so what that means is really understanding the time investment that is going into delivering your service. And so for service-based business owners, especially, this is extremely important because often we do not properly calculate or track our time to really understand how much time is going into creating or delivering the service. When I do bring a client on, how much time am I spending with them? And so tracking your time is the first part of really getting these profit margins down. And Once that's done, once you've tracked your time and you have a good understanding of what your expenses are, meaning just what's coming out of your account on a monthly basis, to keep it simple, what are you paying for on a monthly basis? Because whether you have one client or 10 clients, you're still going to have to pay those uh, those expenses. So we want to make sure that they're accounted for in the cost of running your business as well. And then looking at ahead, looking at your future, what are your goals for the next two years? What are your goals for the next five years of your business? And how can we ensure that your pricing today is setting you up for success tomorrow and is building in the financial resources that you need to be able to continue to invest in your vision and bring those goals to fruition in the next two years or so. So if you want to hire a team member, we have to look at what's the cost of that going to be and is even a 30% profit margin enough 
to be able to make that happen within the next year or two years. So we're not just looking at the volume of clients you can bring in. We're looking at if your clientele remains at a very minimal level, can your pricing support your goals? Can your pricing support your maintenance? Because volume is something that will come with time. It will. If you're consistent with what you're doing, it doesn't matter how long it takes you, you will get there. So volume is going to come. But until we get there, we still need to make sure that we are that you can run the business, that you can pay yourself, that you can afford to just live in the meantime. So that's why the pricing, the profit margins are so important because other things fluctuate, but this has to be able to carry you forward at least to that next step. And so profit margins is really just ensuring that there's a minimum of 30% profit margins. And that takes understanding the time that, that you are investing into delivering your services or creating your products. And then also understanding the expenses that come with running your business, as well as your future goals and making sure all three of those things are accounted for within your profit margins. I agree. And it's something interesting. While you were talking, I was thinking to myself, when we talk about time, that is why having processes in place, automation in place, Mm -hmm. and then using the tools that are available for free. There are so many tools out there that are free and you don't have to buy the fancy funnels and the fancy this and the fancy that in order to run your business and have it run smoothly and to save you time. So I just wanted to point that out because I think a lot of people get sucked into, oh, once I was using this, so I have to use this and they invest in something. It's complex. It's hard to learn. It takes an immense amount of time and you end up decreasing your profit margins when you're doing that. Yeah. And I always recommend to your point, Robin, I always recommend start off with a free version if they have the free trial and make sure you're using it before you pay for it. And if that software or that program doesn't have a free version, email them. They often will give you a free trial of it if you email them and say, hey, I'd like to try this out for a week or two weeks or whatnot. Because yeah, that, that is, I feel, a trap of those of us who work online. There are so many tools and resources available that it's easy to want to invest in them. But often we sometimes don't even know if that's the right thing that we need in order to create a process or a system. Sometimes a process could be as simple as a Google Doc and that doesn't have to cost you anything. And so at your point, yeah, use the free version, make sure that you are actually using it and integrating it before you pay for it. Definitely. Oh my gosh. So that's it. Four pillars, right? Four pillars. Yes. Four pillars. This is amazing. So much information. So Ruth Joy, where can the listeners find you, connect with you, learn more from you? Yes, certainly. So I love to connect with people on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. It's just my name, Ruth Joy Connell as well. I do have a quiz as well that you can access and it's called, am I ready to charge five figures? And so really this walks you through, even if you're not looking to charge five figures exactly, or even if you're not looking to work with corporate clients, this quiz is a great way to to help you understand where you're at now and some of the areas that you might need to create more alignment in order to increase your price, whatever that price increase means for you. And feel free to take the quiz and I'll make sure to provide you with the link as well so that you can post it in the show notes and the quiz will, the results are really what you want to look for because it does really break it down step-by-step as based on your results, here are the things that you should do next. So regardless, you're walking away with a tangible next step. So those are two great ways to get in contact. LinkedIn, from there, you'll find my website and our podcast as well. We're coming out with season two of the Profit Scale podcast, which is available on all of our platforms. So I'm really excited about releasing that and go ahead and subscribe. So when it comes out, you'll be able to catch the episodes there. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Robin.